the age range where autistic symptoms are first diagnosed is usually somewhere around three years old. Well, kids get a lot of vaccines in that period. And, you know, when you talk about millions of kids get vaccines every year, you could easily have several thousand where it looks like the vaccines caused it. That's why we need science. It's unethical to do a randomized study of vaccinated versus unvaccinated, so we have to rely on epidemiology. And epidemiology is quite clear that MMR is not associated with an increased risk of autism. Hello and welcome to Trolling with Logic, where we bring the hammer down on pseudoscience, ignorance, and unreason on a bi-weekly basis. I'm your host, Nathan, and with me, as always, are my co-hosts, Jen and Kitch. How are you guys doing? Hey, you doing guys fantastic. Good. You save it today, mate. Joining us on this episode is special guest Dr. David Gorski, who serves as Professor of Surgery and Oncology at the Wayne State University School of Medicine and is on the faculty of the Graduate Program in Cancer Biology. He is a frequent contributor to sciencebasedmedicine.org and writes under the nom de plume ORAC on the Respectful Insolence blog. Uh, many of our listeners probably have read that blog. And, uh, and, and surprisingly, many probably don't know who <laughs> don't know who ORAC is. Okay, they may know your name and ORAC name, but they don't know that it's the same person. Um, I've come across it before. Okay, even though it's like the worst kept secret. Well. Uh, anyway, welcome to the show, Dr. Gorski. Oh, thanks for inviting me. We are talking today about a pseudoscience propaganda documentary called Vaxxed, From Cover-Up to Conspiracy. And David, you've written some excellent and nicely detailed takedowns of various aspects of this film's claims on your blog. So we'll start with you. What is the movie's central overriding theme and thesis? Well, this is a movie that is basically anti-vaccine propaganda disguised as a documentary. And I like to say it, it, it's not subtle, not in the least. I like to joke that this film is uh, so unsubtle that Leni Riefenstahl would probably say, whoa, that's a little too much, you know. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, the, the central idea is, of course, that vaccines cause autism and all sorts of other horrible things, specifically the MMR. Because, remember, Andrew Wakefield is the uh, director of this movie. And that the CDC not only knew about it, but covered up evidence that showed it back in 2004. And, and that this quote-unquote conspiracy was revealed by CDC scientist by the name of William Thompson, who has taken on a mythical title in the anti-vaccine world of the CDC whistleblower. Uh, the public was first objected to Vaxxed when Robert De Niro, of all people, approved the film for the Tribeca Film Festival that he helped found and organize. Yeah, he 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 bypassed the normal uh, process. How did Wakefield even get the Tribeca Film Festival, which is a pretty prestigious film festival, to accept this film and its lineup in the first place? Well, I I've speculated. Um, it's been suggested... Uh, by some of my viewers, that, that Wakefield came to know Robert De Niro's wife through Robert Rodriguez when Robert De Niro was starring in Machete. Uh, that was filmed near Austin, which is where Wakefield lives. I've, I've gotten a couple emails from people who said that they saw Wakefield on the set, although, you know, take that for what it's worth. However, it's not implausible that that's how they could have met because Robert Rodriguez and his wife both wrote a blurb for, you know, a, you know, a, a nice praising blurb for, um, Wakefield's book, Callous Disregard. And so given that Rodriguez was directing Machete and De Niro was, you know, one of the co-stars, it's not entirely implausible that they could have met that way. Of course, there's lots of anti-vaccine people in Hollywood who, who are, you know, enamored with people like Wakefield. So there could be many other ways that they met. Either way, somehow Wakefield got this movie to Robert De Niro's attention. And as you know, De Niro and his wife have an autistic son, which kind of came out as a result of this. Uh, it was something that wasn't really that publicized. And we've now since learned that, you know, Robert De Niro is pretty susceptible to anti-vaccine woo, and that he seems to have bought into a fair amount of it. The heart and soul, so to speak, of this film is 
Wakefield's fraudulent 1998 Lancet paper that was retracted. Uh, but the movie never explains what that paper actually said. Uh, can you enlighten us on this point? This is a paper that, you know, on the surface doesn't appear to be much. You know, uh, if, if you actually read the paper, it's a case series of a dozen cases where, where there's claimed to be a temporal link between, you know, the onset of autism or autistic bowel symptoms and MMR vaccination. And... On the surface, it's one of those things where you say preliminarily, well, maybe there's something there, maybe there isn't. You know, I, I remember Ben Goldacre didn't think it was that horrible a paper. But then as a result of the investigation by Brian Deere and his reporting, it soon came out that there was a lot of fraud going on there. For instance, these, these patients were not consecutive. They were patients who believed that, you know, MMR had caused their children's autism. It also turned out that... Wakefield's research was funded by a barrister who was looking to sue vaccine companies for mm. vaccine-induced autism. And, 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 I mean, it's too much to go into because there's so, so many different angles. But, you know, you, you could find out a lot of it just by going to Brian Deere's website and reading, you know, his reporting, which is excellent. Uh, but, basically, there's evidence that his research was fraudulent. And, ultimately, he was stripped of his medical license. But he's been living in Austin for a long time. You know, he came over here at least 10 or 15 years ago to help run a clinic called Thoughtful House. And he was actually kicked out of Thoughtful House when he lost his medical license in England, ironically enough. <laughs> How much do we know about this? It's uh, Dr. William Thompson, whose apparent title is Senior Scientist. Um, and how, how much do we know about his veracity and, and in terms of also how much what he said was taken out of context? I, I, the reason this took off, I think, is because it feeds into what I like to call the central conspiracy theory of the anti-vaccine movement, which yeah. is basically that vaccines cause autism, but not only that, the CDC knew about it and is covering it up, or the government knows about it and is covering it up. So what happened, and, and again, this, it's hard to reconstruct because um, as soon as his name was revealed, Thompson lawyered up and hasn't said a public word since. And this was going back to August of 2014. It was really fascinating because I wa this is like the second time in my lifetime that I've watched conspiracy theories be created, you know, like uh, a new conspiracy theory. The first time, of course, was 9 uh, after 9-11. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. It was, this, this is the second time I've watched it actually happen in real time. Uh, how, where do you think it's going to be in sort of 10 years time? Because, of course, 9-11, 10 years after 9-11, people didn't even believe that planes had hit the World Trade Center. So <laughs> do, you think, do, you think, do you think they're going to get to the point in 10 years time where they'll be saying, oh, uh, well, MMR didn't even exist. It was them injecting Ebola into people and stuff like that, you know? Uh, I, pro I bet if looked hard enough, you could probably find someone saying that now already. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in any case, what happened is for whatever reason, it, I've put this together through a lot of reading, reading the transcripts of his conversations, which were published in a book, reading the actual documents that he gave to Representative Posey of Florida. And here's how I put it together, at least as best as I can. It's It's kind of complicated and there are lots of ins and outs but basically for some reason when they were doing a study of children in the atlanta area to look at, you know to look an epidemiological study to look for a link between mmr and autism he was unhappy with the way they were analyzing the data there was you know what appeared to be a correlation in African American boys, but you know, and this is this is where you get the four times increased incidence in African American boys based on timing of, of of vaccination. However, it was a very small subset. When they corrected for various confounders, it disappeared. He was unhappy with the way they presented it. He didn't think that they laid it out perhaps as much as they should have. But you know, if, if it's something that goes away when you start analyzing for confounders, a lot of times. He won't spend very much time on it on the manuscript. Either way, he seemed to have some sort of falling out with his co-authors that festered for years and years. Then for some reason, like in late 2013, I think, he reached out to Bill Hooker. I'm sorry, Brian Hooker. <laughs> if I kept calling him Bill Hooker, they would that would be highly embarrassing. Um, in any case, Brian Hooker is a biochemical engineer, you know, who has an autistic son. And he thinks that vaccines did it. And he um, thinks he can do epidemiology. In either case, he, the two talk. 
and somehow struck up a rapport, and there were several phone calls. But Thompson didn't know that Hooker was recording the phone calls. And they went on and on. They basically had several phone calls where Thompson unloaded about, you know, the CDC and gave him the original data. Hooker reanalyzed the data very incompetently and found, oh my god, there's a fourfold increased risk of autism in African-American boys. Of course, like I said, the anti-vaccine movement latched onto this, even though in every other subgroup, and overall, it was still no correlation. It was just this one little spurious subgroup in the raw data. But in any case, this spurred this conspiracy theory. Now, Hooker told Wakefield, okay? And Wakefield basically couldn't resist making a big thing out of it, and they made this video that popped up in August of 2014 and um, ended up starting this whole thing. They had very selective snippets of, his, of Thompson's conversations with Hooker that they used. You know, they had the scary music. It was like the precursor to Vaxxed. And uh, thus was born the conspiracy theory, um, which has taken off in a way that I never would have predicted back then. This is interesting because uh, the, the fact that Wakefield would latch on to this, because as you mentioned in one of your blog posts, even if the correlations held up, which they don't, suggesting that this fourfold increase crops up only in a small African American population in Atlanta actually does quite a bit of damage to his original claims and disproves them. Right. Well, it's consistent with there being no correlation. And even if you take it at face value and say, okay, there's a correlation in African Americans, it would say, well, there's no correlation in anyone else. <laughs> you know, and, and, yeah. and well, it's actually African American boys, it's an even smaller group than that. They fre frequently show throughout the entire um, so-called documentary that they didn't actually understand statistics or statistical modeling at all anyway. There was one guy who said at one point, and I'm, I'm fairly certain I've got this verbatim, facts are facts, data are data. How do you struggle with data in science? You just publish it once you've done the study and then it's there. And I'm like, well, do you not understand that you have to analyze the fucking data afterwards? Excuse my friend. That was a cringe. <laughs> that was a cringe-ready moment in the film of a. Uh... Well, 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 I'll give you something even more. There is a video that is no longer on YouTube, and I wish I had saved it, but I did blog about it and quoted it, where Brian Hooker's talking about his reanalysis, and he says uh, something like, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have the blog post in front of me. In statistics, simplicity is best. What? And I'm the... like. Oh. And, and I'm like, um, no, simplicity is how you get, you know, false correlations because you didn't correct for confounders, you idiot. Yeah, you use, <laughs> like, use, use simple methods potentially to build a hypothesis, but then your data scientist will go away and they'll actually build a complex, a complex analysis to give you a simple result. Like, for example, in the fashion industry right, where I work, we've got a data scientist who works around the clock doing really complex Python scripting to get us some really, really simple stuff for mail shots, for example. Mm -hmm. If if somebody thinks that statistical analysis of complex data models in terms of medical studies trying to account for absolutely everything is simple, then really not understanding the process whatsoever. And that was something that was apparent throughout this entire film. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you know, the film is... I, I was going to try to watch it again before this podcast, but I didn't get around to it. I, I, I'm probably it's probably better that way because it yeah. <laughs> me to pull my hair out too much. Yeah. Uh, but the the techniques like for instance every time they have thompson talking they have like this little squiggle on the screen yeah oh god what the hell is that you know, and, and, and the constant the constant pulling out of quotes like in a newspaper with these occasional little one-liners that'll pop up really bad people and oh conspiracy and they'll show that up in little blue writing whenever anyone is speaking i was like oh for god's sake like, we could hear them talking I know it, it just feels like that was added in just because they think their audience just can't keep focus for five minutes. Yeah, just given the given the bullet points, given the really bad stuff, you know, given the stuff that makes them paranoid and afraid, leave the rest out of it. Yeah. You know? well, well, I mean, it's also kind of funny, you know, the movie start the, the documentary start uh, propaganda film. I can't, I should not call it a documentary. <laughs> Why am I doing that? It, it starts out the movie. The movie starts out with. You know, the Disneyland measles outbreak, you know, going on, oh, well, they're going to scare you into vaccinating, you know, and then, but little did they tell you, and then into the uh, conspiracy. Yeah. But they never really mention 
that epidemic again or do anything to claim about it. Just it just seems like a just a brief attempt to appear to be neutral. Oh, they did mention it again at the end. Towards the end of the film, they they basically turned around and said, "Well, um, like there's over a million cases <clears throat> of autism, autism spectrum disorder." shown to happen each year or whatever kids are diagnosed over a million kids are diagnosed each and every single year and then they say one every seven minutes and you're like okay right and right. then and then they compare that and they go oh but this this measles outbreak at disneyland that was only like 600 kids and they go look this is a much bigger problem than this problem and i'm like measles isn't a big problem at the minute because kids are mostly vaccinated and if right. you took the vaccines away from people these outbreaks would be much bigger and of course, some people go, "Oh, it's only spots on the skin. It's only a little bit of this and that." And they don't realize oh, well, that there's this massive is, side effects from that as well. Well, right. There, this is this is what I like to call the uh, appeal to Brady Bunch. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, well, no, they, seriously, this is this is a thing in anti-vaccine circles. They point to an episode from 1969 of the Brady Bunch where all the kids caught the measles, and it was kind of treated as a joke. They like they played it as a vacation from school. They weren't really feeling that bad. They were playing Monopoly. Mm. This is like the first season of the show, and there was some tension between who would be the kid's pediatrician, like the girl's pediatrician or the guy's pediatrician, and there was like some little argument about that. Uh, I mean, if you watch the episode, it's kind of cringe-inducing, but um, the idea is, oh, wow, they played measles for jokes. It was just no big deal. There are a couple other, there's like an episode of the Flintstones where measles was played for jokes. Um, and there's also an episode of, oh, I forget what show, but it was from the fifties where, again, measles was played as no big deal. And I'm kind of like, well, yeah, but if you look at the medical literature, you know, it was still recognized that people, kids died of the measles, kids were hospitalized with the measles, got secondary pneumonias, they got, you know, encephalitis, they got, you know, and, and yes, it wasn't super common. But when you have hundreds of thousands of kids getting, you know, getting the disease, even a one in a thousand event, you know, like the mortality is frequently quoted as somewhere around a half, you know, 0.5 to one per a thousand. That's a lot. You know, when you have hundreds of thousands of cases. Maybe it's because I'm not anti-vax that I have a hard time wrapping my head around what the film was trying to accomplish early on in the beginning bits. Shortly after talking about the measles outbreak in Disneyland, there's a, like a montage of media clips featuring very reputable scientists and politicians like Obama and like uh, Dr. Paul Offit and others like that who are talking about the importance of vaccines. These are reputable people and they're presenting a montage of clips of them uh, supporting vaccine and, use without any context what what is that supposed to what kind of signal is that supposed to send to that, anti-vaxxers that's the government the government it's they are telling you to vaccinate it's the basically the appeal to quote-unquote health freedom the idea that the government is covering something up and these people are telling you to vaccinate but they're not telling you all these horrible things that vaccine or that the anti-vaxxers think that vaccines cause. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like you're yeah. being you're being sold a bill of goods is the message. Yeah, yeah. And none of these reputable doctors or scientists are actually interviewed in the film. Well, I, I mean, do you think Paul Offit would sit down for an interview with any of these guys? <laughs> He's actually been tricked before. He's very careful about it now. There was a movie called uh, The Greater Good. I believe he was. They managed to interview him for that. He did not know it was an anti. It, it was kind of like um, Expelled, if you remember that. <laughs> oh God. Where they where they got uh, P. Z. Myers and uh, didn't they get Richard Dawson or Richard Dawkins too? On yeah, that movie? yeah, they yeah. yeah, they fooled him into it. They as misrepresent well. themselves, you know. So I I know Doctor Offit is very careful now. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've had uh, we've had Doctor Offit on our show before, so it's good to know that we're that transparent. It was interesting as well at the very start of the film um, where they did that little bit, or just afterwards, they, start, they actually said, uh, where's the effect of studies say vaccines don't cause, or, cause autism? But look at all these parents that say it does. We should be listening to them. All these parents can't be wrong, which was interesting. And then they said, um, what is this disconnect between science and real parents? Um, well... You know, it's a disconnect that we find a lot and not just about vaccines. I, I, you can look at it in terms of, I, I make the, in fact, I just finished writing a post for science-based medicine tomorrow where I, I mentioned this, this, this issue when it comes to alternative medicine testimonials. Mm -hmm. And, and it's the idea of, you know, not understanding the background, confusing correlation with causation, 
There's mm-hmm. a lot of confirmation bias is another thing. Selective memory that we all suffer from, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, like I like to say, part of one of the biggest part of skepticism is trying to control your own selective memory and your own confirmation bias, and it's mm-hmm. hard. Most people don't even try because they're not aware of it. So yeah, yeah, okay. So they say, oh, it couldn't just be by coincidence. Well, yes, it could. I mean. Mm-hmm. The age range where autistic symptoms are first diagnosed is usually somewhere around three years old, give or, you know, give or take years. Well, kids get a lot of vaccines in that period. So the chances that they will start to show or that someone will notice their symptoms of autism within a reasonably close proximity to a vaccination is fairly high. And, you know, when you talk about millions of kids get vaccines every year, you could easily have several thousand where it looks like the vaccines caused it. That's why we need science. It's unethical to do a randomized study of vaccinated versus unvaccinated, so we have to rely on epidemiology. And epidemiology is quite clear that MMR is not associated with an increased risk of autism. Uh, What mechanism did Wakefield propose for how the MMR vaccine could lead to autism? It had to do something with the gut and interacting with the immune system. Um, he's never really put it in a lot of detail, but somehow the vaccine measles virus strain, which is, you know, an attenuated virus, is supposed to, you know, interact with the, the gut and the immune system somehow to trigger autism. You know, there are, I like to say there are, there are about as many ideas about how vaccines could cause autism as there are anti-vaccine quacks in the world. But, you know, his was all about the gut connection. Some of the later ones are about toxins. Some of that, you know, others say it somehow interferes with glutathione and various metabolic pathways related to that and, you know, and, and antioxidants. And, you know, I, I could go on about so many of these, but... <laughs> There are, I mean, there are a few more mainstream um, authors who have spoken about the link between uh, your microbiome and, and autism. For example, people showing improvement after uh, rounds of antibiotics, for example, in certain aspects of their autistic traits, for example. So I think some anti-vaxxers will hold on to those sorts of well, slightly more mainstream. So, well, if, for example, I, I, Alana Collin in 10% Human, she sort of went over it very briefly. Well, they're very, very uh, good at latching on to the latest yeah. science. That, as long as it's science that is not about genetics, they immediately attack any science that claims to to link any gene or set of genes to autism. But if it's something like microbiome or immunity, you know, autoimmunity, you know, because yeah. there's clearly something or inflammation or anything, you know, any of that science, Leaky which is syndrome. all, which is all very, ten, you know, which is all still. Pretty unclear and tentative, but they're very mm-hmm. good at latching onto that as evidence, and then somehow linking them to vaccines because it's you think always that's, about the vaccines. Do, do you think that's one of those typical conspiracy theorist mindsets? They're trying to find a scapegoat that is human that they can blame for it, rather than it being something that's out of their control. Because a lot of the people in, within this film, for example, were parents of autistic kids, and oh, yeah. something that was brought up time and again was this idea that these kids will never have a good life, and they're depressing, and they're expensive, and all that kind of stuff, which I really took offense to. I mean. Uh, Holly Tommy, her child is like, uh, he's a big kid now, you know, and I could understand how it would be very, very difficult yeah. to deal with him when he gets agitated because he's no longer a little kid that you can just sit on. He's big and strong, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's kind of a, a narrative in the anti-vaccine circles, though, that um, autism has stolen the child. Like, in other words, the real child is gone, and what's left is basically shell. Not quite that blunt. Well, sometimes it is quite that blunt, but it, it's basically their real child has been stolen, and yeah. then they, you know, they they'll never have a normal child, and that's understandable. I don't know how I would have reacted if I had a special needs child, especially someone one with severe autism or something like that. You, you can understand it, but then human nature looks for an explanation. Sometimes that explanation is looking for someone or yeah. something to blame. Yeah, my my um my uncle when I was growing up, he he is he's still alive now. He he is autistic, um, and he was sent to a a school in Germany that had some very weird kind of woo practices, and they tried to heal him with, um, for example, they had they had one kid there who they tried to heal by making him carry a copper bar around with him every single day, 
um, consummate. I have not heard of that one before. <laughs> it, they, they had some very, very strange. I can't remember what the score I mean, was I called. Thought I, heard, I thought I'd heard it all. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what the score was called now. I'll have to ask my mum about it again. But he was, he was, it was like a score stroke um, care home. And they had some very, very bizarre things. And um, when he was there, um, this other kid who was meant to hold, you know, carry around this copper bar, smashed him around the head with it. And then he got brain damage and he sort of degenerated from there. But my mum still sees him and he's still, you know, he's, he's as he always was. So for me, and also my mum being special needs and also having a lot of autistic mm-hmm. friends myself, this idea that uh, they're lesser people uh, or that they should be seen as being uh, at expense who are just a burden, I, I find it quite disgusting. And that was something that came up over and over again mm-hmm. in this film. So perhaps I, no, I've i taken a little does. bit too much emotion into it. It does. Yeah. And they, they also have a tendency, you know, they, they also tend, for instance, when we talk about the quote unquote autism epidemic being due to better diagnosis, more, you know, uh, yeah. et cetera. They, they will scoff at that idea because they view autism as basically only the most severe case. They don't understand the, that it's a spectrum and that there are lots of people with autism who can function quite well with just a yeah. little help, little or, little or no help, or maybe a little more help. You know, it's, it, there's this wide spectrum and, but they only view it as like the worst of the worst. Well, here's the other thing. A lot of these really severely autistic kids, you know, like 50 years ago, would have been called mentally retarded. Diagnostic substitution is another, you know, reason. There is this attitude in a lot of anti-vaccine circles that somehow they are less than, I, I shudder to say it, but less than human, you know, or less, mm-hmm. somehow not quite as worthy of you know, needing, you know, of, of care and human respect. It is, it, it's an attitude. Hmm. I see it and it is disturbing. The concept of diagnostic substitution was something I wanted to hit on because hmm. early on in the film, it claims that, well, today, one in 110 children, I believe it said, have autism up from only one in 10,000. Uh, my understanding it's actually, it's actually is that higher than that. That's kind of an old. That's a somewhat old figure, but yes, that's you know, oh, okay. It's, um, it's my understanding that the actual increase in autism, when you take into account, for example, the fact that the classification criteria for diagnosing autism has been massively expanded in recent decades, mm-hmm. uh, even though there is an increase, it's uh, a lot smaller than what they're saying it is. There may not even be an increase. There are studies that suggest that, that look, have looked at adult populations using today's diagnostic criteria for autism and mm-hmm. finding, you know, rates of autism that are on par with what we're seeing now. Now, of course, it's epidemiology done in various locations, so there's variability and you could, it, there could still be a small increase. But there, it's clear from, you know, these studies that there has not been a massive increase. For instance, people who used to be just considered, like, quote-unquote weird were never diagnosed with anything, you know, why not we now diagnose a lot of them as on the spectrum, you know, with mild autism. Or a lot of a lot of children who would used to previously be considered, you know, mentally retarded, now, thanks to changes in diagnostic criteria, they're now considered, you know, like, severe autism. So there's that. There's also the screening effect, you know. When I say increased awareness, what I really mean is screening. We now basically screen for autism. And I, as I like to say, whenever you look for something harder, you'll find more of it. You know, cause like I said, a lot of, a lot of kids with milder autism were probably never diagnosed as having it. You know, so they could function in life well, but they had, they might have had some traits that we, we associate with autism, but that are, you know, they still manage, you know, reasonably well or even quite well. And they just never had a diagnosis, who today would have been diagnosed as autistic. Mm -hmm. Well, I was diagnosed with uh, Asperger's, but I didn't get that diagnosis until I was in college. So, Well, that's what I I mean. You can have it. That can happen. Absolutely. The documentary claims that the MMR vaccine caused an outbreak of meningitis in Canada, where the vaccine was called Trivirix, uh, that it was then shipped over to the UK, where it was called Plusterix. And where the same thing happened, and finally that it was bobbed off on Brazil by Merck. Um, I looked into this and I couldn't find any confirming information. Is there any truth at all to this story? You know, I, I to be honest, I'm not that familiar with that story. I mean, maybe I should look into it sometime. But I, I've, <laughs> as far as I know, 
one one thing if there's one thing I've learned there there's probably a grain of truth in there somewhere that's been distorted all out of you know beyond all recognition because that's yes. how they handle these things but I'm afraid I can't really I don't know enough about that specific part to comment particularly intelligently on it okay Kitch you had something to say about this in our chat earlier didn't you uh, yes um but I did do, a, to be honest, it was only a preliminary Google search, so I found not too convincing on it, so I couldn't really find much. But on the subject itself, it felt a bit weird. The movie was talking about autism, and now it's shifted to meningitis. Um, well, well, the two well, that's, vaccines... That's because, that's because vaccines are evil. That's why, yep. I mean, so it doesn't really, you know... It, they cause everything, don't you know? If you listen, if you read the anti-vaccine websites, they cause autism. They cause, uh, you know, various encephalitis and brain damage. They cause uh, diabetes, diabetes, asthma, um, autoimmune disease. They uh, make the frogs gay. Oh, oh and, can- <laughs> and cancer. They cause cancer, of course. Yeah. Um, well, the logic gap here is that uh, the film. I think correctly states that Trivirix and Plucerix were pulled from the market because of the meningitis outbreaks. So, uh, why is it then that they would pull that but not pull the MMR vaccine if it was true that it caused autism? The example that they gave shoots down their whole argument here with the other, with the MMR. I think it kind of does and it kind of doesn't because it's saying, oh, it's only because like people found out and it was really obvious the case and therefore you know, because they can't argue away meningitis as an illness as easily as they as they can autism, and that's what they're kind of playing on. But they, oh, they can get away with the autism thing. You know, um, are there any correlations that actually do hold up well for predicting onset of autism that medical research can have confidence in? I've heard, uh, <laughs> I've heard rubella, genital rubella. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard uh, paternal age being suggested as that, one. That's, a, that, that's that's another one, but yeah. Paternal age, and uh, I'm having trouble thinking of any others. <laughs> yeah, it seems like the the anti-vax community and the material they put out, they never actually hit on the the real predictors, the real correlations that are out there. They're kind of incompetent at doing pseudoscience. A lot of pseudoscientists are slick and good with words and good with uh, manipulating data to make it seem like it's saying what they want them to say, uh, but. The anti-vax community seems to just go completely off the rails every time. They don't even try to present information that has any uh, relevance or bearing on what's actually going on in the medical and scientific communities. I don't know if you've noticed that as well. Um, I think it's very cool. There, there are some who are really bad at it, and there are some who are better at it. Now, I know, I don't know that I'd say that any of them are truly good at it, but mm-hmm. there are some who are less incompetent than others, uh, and better at, you know, cherry-picking various bits of data to try to make it seem like they have a case. What did you think of Wakefield's um, kind of attempt to turn his palms over, for example, to show that his palms were empty when he goes, well, the MMR is what's evil, and if we gave the injections separately, I would be okay with that. As if to say, well, I've got nothing to hide. What What did you think of that play? He, did, he, did, he, did he mention that he had, that he was working on separate vaccines? You know, back at the time he started demonizing the MMR? Oh, yeah, he, see, had, so he, he had a patent on, yeah. On a separate, on separate vaccines. He, mm. he stood to profit from that. And um, here's one thing that this movie is, really. This movie is not really about the CDC whistleblower. Uh, it's primarily about Wakefield. This movie is meant to vindicate Wakefield. He is the star of the movie. The parents are not the stars of the movie. The CDC whistleblower is the star of the movie. He's the star of the movie. It's all about him. The whistleblower narrative, I'm guessing, was just the hook to get people interested in watching it? Um, yes, and, and it's you know, it's taken off. It's like it's taken on a life of its own. It's like it has its own Twitter hashtag. It's a, it's a, become part of the many conspiracy theories that anti-vaccine activists have and believe in. What is Dr. Thompson's actual title? Because I'm fairly certain that senior scientist isn't actually a job title. Um, 
I think it is in the CDC. The is way it? they do it. it. I do believe it is an actual title in the CDC. Oh, right. I didn't realize that. It seems but, so vague. Uh, he's, because you don't actually know what he does. But the, but the thing is, if I recall correctly, he's not an epidemiologist by training, although he's done, he's been, he's been co-author or even first author on a fair number of epidemiological studies from the CDC. Okay. Um, and of course, we've heard nothing from him since August of 2014. <laughs> so <laughs> when he when he actually issued a statement that said bluntly that this does not show that vaccines cause autism, like mm-hmm. even with all of his criticism and I think he a lot of sour grapes against De Stefano, who was the first author of the study, he still made it a point to say this does not show that vaccines cause autism. Yeah, they showed that in the uh, film as well. But he did sort of say, well, you know, it, it probably needs more investigation. It's from pseudoscientists. Uh, it always needs more investigation, no matter how negative the study is. Uh, well, uh, Kitsch is our resident uh, bioengineer. W- would that oh, be... I, hope I didn't insult any biological uh, or biochemical engineers here. <laughs> uh, I'm actually a biotechnologist. Oh, okay, is there a difference? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, no. Well, I, I was just going to ask, because you have probably special insight on how unqualified Hooker would be to uh, do a reanalysis of an epidemiological study? Well, from what I know, and from what the movie has t- said, stated publicly, that uh, he's inv- involved in environmental biology. Which I'm not is... entirely clear what his day job was before he discovered the anti-vaccine pseudoscience. I know he's on the faculty of a university in California. It seems like this was his 15 minutes of fame. Can someone explain what an analysis plan is exactly, if it is as they described it in the film, and if deviation from that or alteration to analysis plan is actually a form of fraud? Um, it can be. Now, the thing is, uh, a blogger by the name of Matt Carey, who was the first one to actually obtain the documents that Thompson deposited with Bill Posey's office, and it's really hilarious. He basically just called the office and asked if he could have them. <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and they gave them to him, you know. Uh, and in fact, they were going to reveal that, you know, a guy by the name of Ben Swan, who was a news guy, a news guy in Atlanta, was going to do this big story on them and reveal them. And he basically, you know, scooped them and beat them to the punch and showed that there was really nothing there. It, it, it actually, an analysis of the um, documents shows that one, they didn't actually deviate from the analysis plan, contrary to the claims made in the movie and that have been frequently made over the last two and a half years. So, you know, the final analysis plan was nailed down before they actually did the analysis. But yes, it's one of those things that, yes, it depends. It could be fraud if someone deviates from the analysis plan, but it didn't happen in this case, so it's a moot point as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the, the main claim that they made was that the CD, CDC reduced the number of kids uh, to prevent the increased risk showing um, by changing uh, where the uh, race was picked up from, um, saying it was originally picked up from, was it? Uh, oh, you mean the whole registry? issue? The whole issue of like the birth certificate data? Yeah, that. that's the one, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, that was actually in the, in the plan. Um, it was there. <laughs> so they were going to do both analyses, and they did. It's a um, pretty bad conspiracy if you're just giving away everything from the start. They're not even attempting to hide anything because, yeah. well, there's nothing to hide. Right. And, and I mean, look, here's the other thing that I like to point out. Let's say all of this is true. Okay. The conspiracy theory was true. Okay. This study really did show, you know, fourfold elevated risk of autism in African Americans who were, full base who were vaccinated before a certain age. Let's say that was true. Um, okay, you could throw that study out. Or, you know, or, you know, let's say that, you know, you take that study, which is not that, which is an okay study, the reasonable size, and then compare it to all the other studies that failed to find even a hint of a correlation. And you say, well, what's more likely that this is just a spurious study, you know, or that it overthrows all those other studies? You know, the answer is obvious. I say, you could totally throw out Stefano et al., which is the paper that, you know, the study that is at the heart of the movie. You could throw that out. There's still tons of evidence to show that MMR is not correlated with autism. You know, they're Stephen. focusing on this one because they think they can prove that the CDC lied, which there's no good evidence of that. 
I think it's also hilarious the fact that Wakefield was complaining in his movie about the lower numbers. They lowered it to eight eighteen hundred children that they used. I, in, I, in I, the, I forget I forget the details, but yeah. It's still a hell of a lot higher than Wakefield's original twelve. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just after they said that, that they brought in very briefly for, for one clip, the guy who um, discovered or rather got AIDS recognized, who then, I don't know whether it was, you know, whether they misrepresented what he was saying or whether he's actually on board. And he turns around and goes, oh, it's a big cover up. Um, but then doesn't qualify why he thinks so. And they never bring him back in. Oh, that's right. Luke Montagnier? Yeah, that's the guy. Yeah, Luke yeah. Luke Montagnier was in the movie. Yes, but you do realize Luke Montagnier also now believes in homeopathy. Oh, right, okay, right, okay. <laughs> He's kind of gone off the deep end. Uh, and Why does that years, always happen to the good ones, eh? Oh, dear. Do you think that's because maybe he had a vaccination and he got autism, or...? Well, I don't know. I mean, he's got to be. In, uh, he's he's pretty old now, so I don't know. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> he just forgot all the good science that he did, and now he's just started to play it safe. And uh, yeah. this, this, this is fantastic the way they introduce <laughs> him, just accepting his Nobel Prize as if, hey, look, yeah. he actually got a credible scientist. They did that a couple of times in the film. They they introduced somebody who kind of supports their side. And and earlier in the film, they showed someone next to the Queen. And they go, oh, this guy, you know, he was involved in a study as well. He's next to the Queen. He must be good. <laughs> I was going to say, who was the one next to the Queen? I forgot. Uh, the other thing about Luc Montagnier um, was that he has sort of drifted into a lot of crankery. It's not just homeopathy that he's published studies that he support it he's um, he's appeared in an hiv aids denialist film that said that aids could be cured with supplements and diet and he's also spoken at what i like to call the yearly autism biomed quack fest known as autism one so it's, <laughs> oh god is that is that run by that guy who is profiting quite a lot from this whole autism thing by writing books about it saying it's the age of autism and it's never before seen and it's a um, new illness and all that crap um it was run by the the group you know, it used to be run mainly by Generation Rescue, which was um, Jim McCarthy's group, and then there was some sort of falling out, and now some other group runs it. Interestingly enough, Dan Olmsted, who is the guy who wrote Age of Autism, came up with the idea of the Age of Autism, died recently. And actually, I just learned that he died of a prescription drug overdose. So I don't know what was going on with him. It, 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 sh it did show up in the... It, it, he died, like, sometime around the holidays and then just last week someone sent me a link to a washington post article of prominent deaths and it mentioned that and i was like wow i had no idea i had no idea why he died i didn't really know much about him i just knew he he was actually one of the nicer guys over there i kind of felt you know it's felt basically like I, probably the one got, like... I probably could have gotten along with him if he wasn't such a crank <laughs> Wasn't he the same guy who was saying that the vaccination was a conspiracy to vaccinate you your whole life? And that the whole thing was uh, just... He, he was the one who claims there were no autistic Amish. What? Mm. <laughs> oh, you haven't heard that one. That one's no. Like a, that one goes back to like 2004, 2005. But wait, do, don't the Amish not go to doctors anyway? Well, or they have their own well, physicians? Well, there is that, but there are autistic Amish too. There, <laughs> It's like, it's not true that there are not. Well, obviously, but that, what I'm saying is, like, if they don't actually go to general practitioners that everyone else goes to, they wouldn't necessarily get the death. Uh... But he did found the Age of Autism blog. Uh, he was a U he was actually a UPI reporter. He wrote a series about the Age of Autism, where he claimed not that the MMR was causing autism, but a mercury in the vaccines from time aerosol uh -huh. back then. That was his little area of anti-vaccine pseudoscience. That's one of the things that made it very, very different to most of the anti-vax stuff that I've looked at. This, this film didn't really go into the ingredients very much at all. And that, and that was what would, that's what kind of confused me. It made me also think that it was something to do, to do more with Wakefield than to do with the anti-vax movement in general. That's because the movie's about Wakefield, you know. They're, yeah, yeah. I, I was shot, you know, I was actually kind of surprised at that too. There, you know, one frequent gambit and anti is what I like to call the toxins gambit. Like somehow mm -hmm. vaccines have these horrible toxins that cause toxic overload. Yeah, and, you know, like the formaldehyde, even though there's so little formaldehyde there that, like, a baby has about five times as much in its bloodstream as is in any vaccine, you know? it's And the fact is, we make formaldehyde as a normal byproduct of our metabolism in small amounts. We can go on and on, because there's, there's, they can pick it, a whole bunch of ingredients, and it's basically what the food babe does, except with vaccines. You take, like, scary-sounding yep. chemical names and say, oh, my God, it's in vaccines, you know? <laughs> Do you think the fact that that wasn't in there also might have something to do with the fact that this 
documentary Vaxxed is perhaps trying to polish itself up and trying to distance itself from the real crazies out there and make itself more respectable. I've seen um, other pseudoscience documentaries try to do that, like uh, GMO OMG, the anti-GMO movie. I've never actually seen that movie. (laughs) It tries to polish itself up and make it you know, family friendly and make it make its claims really mild, but at the same time have an undertone of extreme hatred for GMO and other biotechnologies. There may have been something like something of that, but I think maybe those would just be weeds that would distract from the central conspiracy theory of the movie. I think that might have been it. I, I mean, I was kind of amused how um, they got that one doc. Well, first off, Bill Bigtree, who was the producer of the movie was also a producer for The Doctor. He did quite a few episodes. They got that one doctor uh, from The Doctors, and I'm blanking on what her name was. She's the African-American pediatrician who's been convinced by this movie that vaccines can cause autism, and she actually wrote a letter that's on the Vax website. And, uh, and I'm still blanking on her name. But in any case... And, and then... Uh, who else did they get in there? Oh, there was a... Oh, Dr. Rachel Ross, that's the name. Oh. And then they got Dr. Jim Sears, who is, you know, Bob Sears' brother. I mean, there was this whole funny thing about how there was a there was a scene that was, like, so blatantly scripted, you know, uh, where they had uh, Sears looking over supposed data from the CDC whistleblower and having shocked looks of, uh, looks on his face, you know, <laughs> and, then, and then coming out and saying, oh my God, this is horrible, you know, vaccines can cause autism. I mean, that was like pure reality show. Mm. Yep. Uh, well, before we get on to our two questions that we got from some of our listeners, uh, I wanted to ask, what advice would you give for attempting to change the mind of somebody who's anti-vax and bring them around? It's extremely difficult because of <sighs> things like confirmation bias and yes. the fact that beliefs and facts are conveyed in their minds and all of our minds, really. The other thing, and this is true of anyone who, who's fallen for, this, for pseudoscience, is that they don't understand that every human being has these issues with thinking, like confirmation bias and such. So when you start doubting their story or their memories, they think you're calling them a liar. And they yeah. react accordingly. You know, it's, I've seen it so many times, especially with alternative cancer cure testimonials. You start going through the sequence of events and saying, well, you know, this seems not to match with what you're telling me. And no matter how careful you are to say, I'm not, you know, try to make the point that this is like likely confirmation bias or you know selective memory which we all suffer from they, they think you're calling them a liar i'm not lying you know and that they shut down immediately and i don't i've yet to figure out a really good way to get around that oh so we've had uh vance crow on our show before uh he's a director for millennial engagement at monsanto and as you probably know monsanto has gotten a lot of hate Um, (laughs) i would not want his job (laughs) yeah he he's talked about steering the conversation towards values and reaching out to a tribe outside of your own tribe and um instead of bombarding people with facts you figure out what it is that they value most and connect with that while at the same time keeping integrity with the facts and the science and i think i think that mediating of uh, appealing to people's values which is emotional and subjective while at the same time sticking to the science and being objective about what facts are and what role they play in our lives i think that's the most difficult part right there here's the other thing that i think you need to do uh especially with anti-vaxxers most people who express anti-vaccine views are not what i would call hardcore anti-vaxxers. They've heard stuff, they've read stuff on the internet. But there are hardcore anti-vaxxers. You need to learn to recognize those because, and not waste your time on them because you are not going to change their mind no matter how hard you try. In fact, you're probably just going to make them dig in more. Yeah. You need to try to learn to recognize people who are reachable and concentrate on them because are you going to go after like the parents in that movie and try to persuade them. You're going to fail. You know, you, you, I don't care how good you are. You, you have like maybe a one in a thousand chance of success. 
<laughs> However, the parents who watch this movie and don't have enough, you know, who aren't so emotionally invested in the idea, but they just hear this stuff and it scares them and they think, well, maybe I shouldn't vaccinate my kid or maybe I should delay the vaccines. They are reachable. And it was strategy that you just described, you know, with the shared values and, you know, going and, and that sort of thing and concentrate on them. Like, it, cause like I said, you're not going to persuade the hardcore Wakefield followers. Right. We'll wrap up with uh, two questions that we got from our listeners. The first is from uh, Brian from Glasgow Skeptics. Do we skeptics do more harm than good trying to stop public screenings of stuff like this? We may just be giving their events more publicity at times. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, because I've been, I've come down on both sides of this question. And, and I'm also very much a free speech kind of a guy. So whether or not, I, I think, and this may sound like I'm a, a waffly answer, but I think it kind of can. I, I think in most cases, it's probably pointless to try to shut down screenings and that you might do better by trying to be there to inform people who are showing up. Although, to be honest, that's a risky strategy too because they tend to film you if you're doing that and try to put you on YouTube. So, <laughs> no, they do. I swear. You know, there have yep. been skeptics groups who have shown up at these screenings with leaflets, information, you know, signs trying, you know, trying to point out the misinformation in the movie and they grab a film crew and come on over and try, you know, try to get you to tape you and talk to try to make you look bad. But, you know, I, I think trying to shut it down probably does create more of a backlash than a good. And that even in spite of the risk, the better approach is probably information rather than trying to shut down the showing. And I can uh, change my mind tomorrow. Cause as I said, I've been on both sides. Of <laughs> yeah. I feel like I have as well. Uh, any thoughts from either of you? Uh, Jen or Kitch? I definitely agree that um, if you shut down these sort of screenings, you're definitely going to feed into that conspiracy theory mindset of a lot of the um, people who would buy into this movie. So I would definitely come down on just be there to correct the misinformation and try to get your message out there. Basically, just shout louder uh, than the opposition, but shout correct. Correctly. It's, all, it's also not a bad idea if you if, if you have some really hearty, knowledgeable souls to get them in there to actually see the movie and and, and try to get questions in at the Q and A that make them uncomfortable. Mm. Some people from Manchester Skeptics went into David Eigen Manchester not too long ago, and I didn't go just purely because I wouldn't give him my money. Well, that any- is the one thing that I really hate about doing that is like you, you do give them so, a little bit of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't justify it, especially with a multimillionaire like him. Um, but I mean, I, I'm on the, I'm definitely not the kind of person who would encourage people to block something being shown because like Kitch says, it's, it's counterproductive most of the time. It fuels the fire. Um, our other question is from Pete, who tweets at, at Pet Johnville on Twitter. He asks, do anti-vaxxers get sued or have legal action against them for their dangerous campaigns? Ooh, you really should get Dorit Rice on. She might know that. I don't know. That's an oh. interesting question. Yeah, that is a legal question, I it's guess. It's a legal question. I'm not a lawyer, and I've not been aware of any sort of a lawsuit like that, but I haven't really been looking either. Um, it would be an interesting strategy, but I, the question is... Well, what would the legal basis of doing that be? And I'm totally unqualified even to speculate very much on that. Yeah, th- there is something called vaccine court that a, lo- a lot of anti-vaxxers go on and on about. And our friends over at the League of Nerds podcast have just today put out an episode about vaccine court. So I well, would vaccine suggest- court. That's a different thing, though. I mean, it, yes, vaccine court was was formed as a result of the national the national uh, childhood vaccine injury act of 1986, you know, under Ronald Reagan, because. There were so many lawsuits against vaccine manufacturers that we were very much worried that they would all leave the country. They would all stop selling vaccines in the U.S. You know, it was a, it was that big of a crisis. The idea of, and the vaccine court is that, contrary to the way it's demonized is actually pretty amazing. For one thing, it pays the legal expenses of the uh, complainants. Certain injuries are basically automatically reimbursed, you know, or automatically compensated, I should say. You know, what they're called table injuries. And 
the standards of evidence are a little less restrictive. So it's really a pretty reasonable deal. Now, lawyers hate it. The, the, hate, the hate at the vaccine court is primarily, I think, driven by lawyers who want to sue companies and get big payouts and get their one-third cut of it. Right. Uh, it's not, they're not acting in the parents' interest. They're acting in their interest when they try to attack the vaccine court. I, I remember, oh, I blank on where I saw this. There was this, I think it was from The Greater Good, which was the, uh, you know, another anti-vaccine movie from a few years ago, where they had lawyers. You know, there was a scene where they basically had lawyers complaining about how bad the vaccine court is. They're all lawyers who want to sue big. I mean, you know, most of those lawsuits are going to lose, and most of those parents will never see a dime of compensation because it's, you know, legally outside of the vaccine court, it's so much harder. It was so much harder to win. But the occasional lawyer would get a big payout. You know, the occasional parent might get a big payout. The occasional lawyer would get his cut of that. So, I, I mean, I think the vaccine court, as imperfect as it is, is a good compromise that allows most serious adverse reactions, as rare as they are, to vaccines. You know, it allows compensation in a re- reasonably rapid and just fashion. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, at this point, I think we're ready to wrap up our show for today. Thanks again to Dr. David Gorski for joining us. Uh, it was a good conversation. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, Thank you for coming. And, awesome. and uh before we go, we do have a Patreon account. If you like our show and want to support us with a five dollar or more donation per episode, you can do that at Patreon now. And doing that gets you access to bonus content like uh extended interviews if we do them and stuff like that. And uh we also want to remind listeners to uh leave us a review on iTunes if you're so inclined. That helps us out a lot as well. Uh, we do want to thank our two patrons that we have so far, uh, Microbloganism and Josh at the Society for the Advancement of Science, both of them on YouTube. Thanks again, everybody, for joining me, and I'll see you next time. See you in a couple of weeks. Get your kids vaccinated. Yes, and thanks for inviting me.